All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. So today we're going to be taking a look at the beginning of the revolutionary era. So we're going to be focusing primarily on the French Revolution today. So here we see one of the more famous paintings that deals with the French Revolution. It's basically liberty leading the people to victory. Um, the French Revolution went on for about 11 years, and it would put forward these ideas, liberty, equality, and fraternity, and fraternity meaning like brotherhood. All right, so where do we start? We start with the beginning. The political like makeup of France during this time is broken into thirds. So the, we and these thirds are called the estates, as you can see here with this chart. Uh, the clergy being the first estate, the second estate being the nobility, which would include the king. And then there's the third estate, which is everybody else, 97% of the population. And they owned about 65% of the land. This includes like middle class people, lower class people, like down through the poorest of the poor. All right. Now, the first state. This is, you know, we're talking, you know, the whole idea of the estates is an old system that has basically been around for generations at this point. And it's a class system that you are born into and you remain in for your entire life. It'd be very, very difficult for anybody to go into another estate. All right, so the first one, the clergy, France is a big Catholic country. So we have the Catholic priests in here. Uh, they pay no taxes. And you know, if you're higher up in the church, you live a very comfortable lifestyle, a uh, little bit of the luxury life. The second estate, that's your nobles. Uh, they are, these are the old families, the old nobility families. They are big time landowners and they're only about 2% of the population. They own a quarter of the land and they don't pay taxes. They have all of these special privileges that come with this second estate, which is the high positions in the government. They are part of the church as well. And they are the leaders of the army. They're the officers. Of course, very nice lifestyle to live if you're in the nobility. You got the money for it. And their income comes from the peasants that live and work on their land. Which of course brings us to the third estate. Uh, this is broken up into two different groups. We have the Burgoisi, which is what we would consider the middle class, uh, the business owners, the merchants, the bankers. All right, they pay, you know, high taxes. And you know they it's all like the working class and the peasants. So low wages, they make up well farmers, you can see here the peasantry, they make about eighty percent of the population, which means about seventeen percent is the Burgoisi, which still heavily outweighs the nobility and the clergy. And you know, the peasants and everybody. The, right here on this page, they pay basically all the taxes. And yeah, it, it's just everything is on their shoulders to basically support and keep the country of France going. So without these people, there is no France. All right, this chart right here, basically showing the decline of everything. And we'll just go ahead and move past that to here. So why no taxes for rich or powerful people? As you can see here, the answer is it would keep them on the king's side. They hold, they own the land, so the king needs their support when he wants to do things, right? And the rest of them, they hated the king for this. As you can see here with the uh, political cartoon, basically how the clergy and the nobility is crushing the life out of the peasants 
And you can see here we have our peasantry dude who is being crushed by a stone, which is basically, you know, the weight of the other guys. And it's killing them. Of course, it's figuratively, but we mean financially, it's killing them. Now, some things that are going to help lead to the French Revolution. Taxes. The peasants and the lower classes are paying all the taxes and the nobility and the clergy do not have to pay anything. Uh, France is in debt. Where the American Revolution was going on from you know, 1776 through the early 1780s, uh, France was loaning us a bunch of money, about $6 million back then, which would be you know, tens of millions or so today. So that was like half of the national budget was given in loans for us to fight against England. 25% of their budget went into their own military expenses and about 6% of the remaining 25 uh, was spent on the king and all of his lavish lifestyle, uh, living it up in Versailles. And along with the queen, this would be Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. All right. There's going to be some crop failures due to, you know, some not great weather for farming. And there's going to be inflation. So money's going to hold less value. So you have to use more of it to get things because of the debt that the country is in. All right. Something else that is going to play a role it, it aided with the American Revolution, and it will also be a big piece of the French Revolution. The American Revolution actually does serve as an example to the French people, okay? Uh, because we incorporated all these Enlightenment ideas in the framing of the Declaration of Independence and later the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, you know, basically giving the power to the people, and the people are the backbone of how the government runs. So all of those same ideas, like John Locke's idea of natural rights, such as life, liberty, and property, which we changed to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, this is going to be an idea that's going to stick with the French and how the people have the right to overthrow a government that is not protecting their natural rights of life, liberty, and property. Now, another big factor is the weak leadership of King Louis XVI and his wife Marie Antoinette. They were young and made a lot of dumb decisions on how to run the country. Uh, a lot of unnecessary spending is going on, and it's just a very bad formula in France right now for these two. Because, you know, the lavish lifestyle they live is not how everyone else in France lives, and they are naive to that fact. Plus, Louis XVI, he didn't really care much for ruling a country. He kind of just wanted to do his own thing and didn't care where his money came from. So, we also have these social classes. Of course, the first and second, they live in you know, the, all these privileged lifestyles. And the third estate, they are the vast majority of the population, they're paying all the bills, well, they're paying for all the bills, and the Burgoisi, that middle class, which is the educated portion of the third estate, they are the ones who are really clutching onto and liking these Enlightenment ideas like John Locke, like Montesquieu, like Rousseau, and they are going to become the leaders of the revolution in France to give the power to the people which is the majority of the people in this case. Now, the Estates General is a meeting of the three estates, and this is something that had been going on in France for quite a long time. Uh, Louis XVI is going to call in for the Estates General meeting, and the idea is to get the first and second estates to start paying some taxes and to so we can raise money to pay off the debts of the country as well as to you know, fund other projects that are going on. 
This is the first time that they've met in 175 years. This is something that's not annual. It only happens when the country needs it to happen. Each estate gets one vote. And so basically the first and second get together and they block the third estate from being able to do anything that they think needs to be done, such as you know, the first and second estate having getting to uh, pay taxes. Because of course the third estate's voting on that. Why should all the financial burden be on them, right? But the first and second, of course, don't want to do that. So it's a two against three vote, and the third estate just storms out of the uh, the meeting, and they form the national assembly. Now, this is a very big deal they're going to take a very big step here. So they are going to go through the three types of citizen actions to change the government. First, we're gonna get protests and we're gonna get political actions such as people writing changes to laws and trying to get them enacted. And then we're going to get full on revolution where we are trying to aggressively overthrow the existing government and reinstate a new government or re and just insert a new government, I should say, into place that should be more fair to its citizenry. Now, the National Assembly that I mentioned when the third estate stormed out of the Estates General, they go basically across the street to base, it would be like, um, like if we stormed out of a town hall meeting and went over to the YMCA and met in their gymnasium. Uh, so they go to basically this, uh, a gym and they go into a tennis court that is inside and they give what is called the tennis court oath. Basically, we are not going to leave this room, all the representatives of the third estate, until we write a constitution for the country of France. All right. So the king, he sees that this is happening and he gives the order that the first and second state are to join the National Assembly and put, give their input into writing this constitution because there's a fear that the third estate, if they're left unchecked and unchallenged, uh, what they might be able to accomplish. All right. So while this is all happening, this is all in like the same day, basically, uh, the king gets troops for his protection and people get the wrong idea and they think that he's actually going to have the troops storm the uh, tennis court and basically uh, break everything up and start arresting people. And that actually isn't what was going on. He just was like, in case this gets bad over there, um, I want some backup. Now, a little bit of time goes by. The king doesn't really do anything with what uh, the third estate is wanting. So we're moving to the revolution part. This is the beginning of the French Revolution proper. It is the storming of the Bastille. The Bastille was a jail for political prisoners. It also had a stockpile of weapons so the people on July 14th of 1789, it's their version of 4th of July. It's called Bastille Day. They're basically their day of independence. And they attack this prison. They set free the prisoners that are there. And because it's a, it's a symbol of the injustices of the monarchy and their abuse of power over the people. So now the people who are leading the revolution, they are going to write what is called the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizens. This would later become like the modern day French constitution. This would be a part of it now. So the purpose is to establish equality just in France for all people and get rid of the class system. There are no more estates. Everyone is equal politically. Uh, bringing in a lot of those enlightenment ideas, 
Montesquieu's separation of powers. So having branches of the government. Uh, Rousseau that you know, follow the, the will of the majority, not the few, but the many. And John Locke's belief in the natural rights. And there would be quite a bit of influence from Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. And of course, Louis XVI is going to reject this. And it's like, yo, we're not doing this. It challenges my power. I'm the king. I'm in charge. Do what I say. That's very much how we how the kings are, right? So that's going to lead to some problems. Because we're getting more protests happening, such as the 6,000 women march on Versailles because of food shortages and the price of bread going through the roof. And yeah, it basically is going to force the king to accept the Declaration of Rights of Man and the National Assembly being a political entity that has to be in place. Uh, Louis XVI is going to be arrested after this and forced, and he's forced to leave Versailles and go to Paris. Now, the first French constitution is going to be 1791, and it makes them a constitutional monarchy with a one house government which is called the National Convention. That would be like if our Congress was only made up of the Senate or just the House of Representatives, only one of those houses, right? The king is the executive, so the equivalent of our president, and everyone is equal, all legislators, all the representatives in that one house in the National Convention get one vote, and they would be seated in their chamber for discussing things by their political beliefs, like how in our, uh, our Senate and, well, actually it would be our uh, House of Representatives, how the state, basically you talk about the left side of the aisle, the right side of the aisle. It's basically that idea. Now, the three groups that there would be in the National Assembly are we have the radical left, which support democracy and huge, huge changes. They wanna basically completely toss out the old system and start fresh, and they're called the Jacobins. Then we have the moderates in the center who believe a constitutional monarchy is like the way to go. So we get some stuff staying the same, we get some changes coming in. It's a more reasonable deal between the two main, like opposing sides. And then we get the right, which is reactionary. And there's like, we don't like all these changes that are happening and we wanna keep it in absolute monarchy. Okay. So the Jacobins start to gain a lot of momentum with political power uh, and in that that's in just a year later, 1792, they want to make a republic. So that's like what we have, where it's a representative government. We vote on people to represent us in the government, and they are to carry out the will of the people that they represent, not their own interests. So Louis XVI, because of the Jacobins, he is brought before the convention. He is basically put on trial and basically for being a, a, for crimes against the people of France for abusing his power. And he is sentenced to death. He's executed by guillotine. If you don't know what a guillotine is, I'll describe it real quick. Basically picture a bench, like a wooden bench that you lay face down on with two big posts going up from each side of your head, figure about, 10 feet in the air, and there's a track that goes between these two posts that uh, when a rope is released, drops a very heavy blade, slanted blade at like a 45 degree angle that comes sliding down the track and slices your head off with that blade. All right, it was developed by a doctor of all people uh, with the last name Guillotine and uh, because he wanted to make a more humane way of executing people, all right? Because it's supposed to be quick and painless. And this is how 
Louis the Sixteenth, and his and after him, his wife Marie Antoinette are killed by beheading with the guillotine. When this happens, it is going to send shock waves throughout Europe. And countries like Austria and Prussia, two places that we've talked about already that have absolute monarchies, they are going to declare war on France because they want to get France back under absolute monarchical control because they don't want the ideas of the revolution in France to spread into their countries starting their own revolutions that would make them lose their power. It's a domino effect that they're trying to prevent from spreading any further than it is in France. All right, so the king is out of the uh, place. He's out of the picture, I should say. And then we get the one of the leaders of the Jacobins, Robespierre. And he is going to begin what is known as the Reign of Terror. So he wants to change from the constitutional monarchy to a republic, and he is going to execute anyone related to the monarchy, whether it's like priests and nobility. Uh, he's going to execute people who are he deems as traitors to the revolution. He's going to kill about 40,000 people over a very short period of time. So as you can see with this pie chart, um, not a very big percentage of them are actually nobility and clergy. It's only about 15%, 15 to 16%. And the rest of them are all commoners. The lower classes, like the middle class people down through the peasants, all killed by guillotine. Uh, yeah. So one of the um, interesting things about this, uh, some certain days, there would be so many executions that um, that track that the blade of the guillotine goes down would get gunked up with blood buildup. So it would slow down the speed of the blade to where it kind of just bounced its way down and it wouldn't exactly cut through all the way. So they might have to drop the blade two or three times to fully cut someone's head off. Yeah, pretty messed up. Uh, the reign of terror would come to an end when Robespierre himself gets executed by guillotine for being a quote unquote traitor to the revolution. I think that's some pretty poetic justice right there. Now, there is going to be something called the Committee for Public Safety that is put in place. And it's basically like a neighborhood watch that is hunting down traitors. And this is like the group that would have gotten Robespierre and turns them over to the court. And people, they are just turning on each other saying, kind of like um, people used it as payback in a way, like think the Salem witch trials. Uh, some people were accusing each other of being witches just to get payback for like an insult or to like get something they wanted after that person was killed. So a lot of innocent people would actually be executed due to issues like that during the reign of terror as well. Now, we're going to get a new constitution in place after the reign of terror. It's going to give us two houses so kind of like how we have two houses in our legislature, the Senate and the House of Representatives, there's going to be a five-man executive committee. So instead of a president or a premier or the constitutional king, uh, we're going to have a five-man committee in place of a president. Power is going to be more divided. You would think it would be good, but there's going to be some challenges. They can't make any decisions because they kind of have to agree unanimously about accomplishing anything. So they're not able to accomplish anything at all. Because you, if you get a group of people together, not everyone is going to agree. All right, we're going to get a growing gap between the rich and the poor. So like the merchant class and all the upper, the middle class people, they're, a lot of them are gonna start getting richer and poorer people are gonna start getting poorer. And this is going to dissatisfy a lot of people. It's going to bring even more social unrest. 
and the people are basically looking for someone to lead them out of the chaos. Does anybody want to guess who that person is? There's a portrait of him right here on the slide. I certainly hope that you guys have heard this guy's name before. Napoleon Bonaparte, which would be how his name was originally pronounced, but we know him as Napoleon Bonaparte. He was a Corsican, uh, which is Italian in ethnicity, uh, but Corsica came under the control of the French about 100 years before he was born. So technically, he's actually Italian, but he'd become, he would be known as like one of the most famous Frenchmen to ever live. Now, his popularity would rise during the wars against Prussia and Austria because he would be one of the, he got his start as a artillery officer. He was in charge of cannons. He became the expert in the French military when it came to how to use cannons and use them well. So he would help turn the tide of battles against the Austrians who were one of the big powerhouses of the time. So he became very popular, very famous in France. All right. He would deal with conflicts with the British. Uh, he did campaigns in Italy. He went to Egypt at one point. We'll get into some of this stuff later when we're talking about Napoleon. But uh, there is this one story about how he stopped in a uprising in Paris uh, with a cannon. He basically fired a shot or a couple of shots from cannons in the streets of Paris to scare off crowds, basically to help save the directory from like coming into existence because people didn't really want it at first, but then they see that Napoleon's backing it. So, Hey, maybe it's not that bad. Now in 1799, he's going to stage a coup d'etat where he, it, it's a fast, aggressive takeover of power, and he's going to name himself the consulate. So basically, he's naming himself like um, dictator over the government. And then five years later, he's going to become emperor. He crowns himself the emperor of France. So yeah kind of interesting how he becomes the thing that the revolution began to get rid of, a monarchy system. You're going to have to keep that in mind for later on. All right, so this is where we're ending today. When we come back next time, we'll be talking about the arts, uh, literatures, artwork, uh, architecture, things like that that are going on during this period, during the revolution period. So like we're looking at 1600s through the, like the year 1800, what's going on. All right. See you guys next time.